tasteful. I'm very modest here at the Bridget Empire Channel. You'll only see three quarters of my tit at any one time. For the whole tit. Subscribe to the... <laughs> Don't. So, not, not real. Hi. I'm Bridget Empire, political correspondent for BBW News, and this is the Empire Statement. Things. Oh, oh really? Yeah, 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 I'm a con oh. addict. Oh. Great Britain. An ironic name for an island in the North Atlantic with a god complex. In theory, every five years, the people of the UK vote for their local MP, and the party with the largest number of votes runs the national government. In practice, whenever an election occurs, members of the two major parties pick the leader of the party, and the British public is left with a choice between two potential leaders, and sometimes the British public gets no say at all, and one party simply crowns their new overlord with no outside consultation, and the nation wakes up one day with a prime minister they never elected, and have to wait potentially years to have a say in whether they approve. If they don't, they can choose the other guy. If they don't like either, well, if you don't like it, there's the door. What? Did you think this is some sort of democracy? If you paid any attention to British politics in the last month, or more, depending on when this comes out, you'll know that our current clown prince of crime, Boris Johnson, has been ousted from power by his colleagues in the Legion of Doom. On his face, this is because he refused to take action against a sex pest called Chris Pincher. Not a joke. Uh, that's his real name. But the writing's been on the wall for uh, everyone's least favourite party animal for a while now. In fact, as Chancellor, the man in charge of the UK's financial policy for the last couple of years, bought the domain name for his Conservative leadership bid back in 2019. So, the man's prepared. But who is he? And why will he be terrible for the country if he is chosen as Johnson's successor? And who's the other one, and why is it exactly the same story? Well, I'm glad you asked, because today we'll be finding out who Rishi Sunak is, why he's just another in a long tradition of politicians guilty of a little crime against humanity that people on the left like to call social murder. That was the end of the sentence. Strap in, boys, because we're going to the deep... <laughs> that sounds terrible! Strap in, boys, we're going deep into the journey to the putrid heart of the Conservative Party. But that is where my story began. Family is everything to me, and my family gave me opportunities they could only dream of. But it was Britain, our country, that gave them and millions like them the chance of a better future. Rishi Sunak is the only sitting MP to make it on the list of the richest households in Britain. Husband to the daughter of one of the richest people in the world, a former Goldman Sachs banker and hedge fund partner. A true man of the people, in other words. Sunak went to Winchester College instead of Eton, like posh boys Boris Johnson and David Cameron, before going to Oxford University, where he made friends with people from all walks of life, both, aristocrat both aristocrats and the upper class. What a babe. I have friends who are aristocrats, I have friends who are upper class, I have friends who are, you know, working class, but I'm uh, not well, working class, but I mix and match and then I go to see kids from an inner city state school and tell them, you know, to apply to Oxford and talk to them about people like me and then I shock them at the end of chatting to them for half an hour and tell them I was at Winchester and you know one of my best friends is. A few months after the election of haunted bin bag Boris Johnson in 2019, Rishi Sunak was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer, the British equivalent of a finance minister, and you'll never guess what happened only a month and change later. That's right, it's the plague. <laughs> Sunak famously rolled out something called the Eat Out to Help Out scheme in the middle of the pandemic to try and restore, to try and, well it's hard to pick a word for this, to try and help restaurants recover from months of low foot traffic, which directly led to the deaths of thousands from, you know, the plague that we were in the middle of. Uh, he also cut benefits and raised national insurance at the tail end of the pandemic, effectively punishing the poor for being poor, following a period in which income inequality skyrocketed and big businesses were giving millions of pounds to distribute amongst their shareholders and boards. What a guy. For what it's worth, it's not like he has a plan for the climate crisis either. He's already pledged to maintain a ban on new wind farms in the UK, despite Great Britain being one of the best placed countries to profit from high wind capacity in the world. Still, the public knows his name. 
mainly because of the British press, the most fine and normal minds in the country, who I am proud to work for, tried to push the narrative that he was some kind of sex god, Dishi Rishi, as they like to call him, in articles like, admit it, you fancy Rishi Sunak. Yes, this short king who killed millions of <laughs> This is terrible. Why? I, that's not even in the script. And BBC's Newsnight even depicted him as literally Superman of finally rolling out a furlough scheme for workers during the pandemic. An idea from then Labour Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell that Conservatives had to be dragged kicking and screaming into carrying out. And it's not as if his opponent is better. Liz Truss is famously transphobic, can barely speak English, called the Irish Prime Minister a tea sock, and is itching to start an all-out war with Russia. She's as wedded to austerity and starving the poor as Sunak, except she's less competent and more completely unhinged. Um, as an off-the-cuff example right here, um, she literally, while I was making this, said that she was going to cut, cut taxes to help with interest rates, which is not, not how that works, and that she is going to deport even more people to Africa, a thing which I think we all agreed was a fucking terrible idea in the first place. Um, so that's the kind of person you're dealing with. She's standing as a further right candidate than even Sunak. She's pro-fracking, and the only idea she's put forward in the current Tory leadership contest are cutting taxes and, as I said, deporting more people to Africa. <laughs> what can they get me out of this country? The thing is with cutting taxes, it's something which will definitely help the current crisis and totally won't make it worse to the point of starting riots in the streets, although in her defence, Sunak is promising nothing different. And what would you expect? They're not even two sides of the same coin. They're both on the same side. They're British Conservatives, and their answer to rising social inequality is good. That's the way it should be. Because the Conservatives are not the party of ambition, like they like to claim. They're the party of social murder. Political decisions were made which resulted in the deaths of these people. That's a scandal. But murder means a specific thing. Murder means a volition to actually kill another well, human being, long, intentional killing. No, there's a long history of, of, in this country of the concept of social media murder, where decisions are made with no regard to the consequences of that, and as a result of that, people have suffered. Mm. That's what's happened here, and I'm so angry you, you, about you it. regard it as murder? I, I believe social murder has hurt, occurred in this instance, and I believe that people should be held accountable. And so who are the murderers? I think there's been a consequence of political decisions over years that have not addressed the housing crisis that we've had, that have cut back on local government, so proper inspections have not made, cut back 11,000 firefighters, been, jobs have been cut as well, even the investment in aerial ladders and things like that in our country. So the politicians who sanctioned the cuts are murderers? I believe the politicians have to be held to account. I remain angry at how many people have lost their lives as a result of political decisions that have been made over years. The term social murder was coined by Karl Marx's totally heterosexual life partner Friedrich Engels in 1845 to describe the conditions of the working class in England and refers to the unnatural death that occurs due to social, political or economic oppression. Engels argued that the conditions created by the ruling classes in England were intentionally placed in the lower classes in precarious and ultimately deadly situations as an explicit campaign of class war on the poor by the rich. Social murder as a term can refer to both the resulting conditions of capitalist exploitation and as a direct result of public policy. In other words, social murder is already the normal in our current system, it's part of the background noise of our unequal society, but it can also be a deliberate choice. And certain political choices make it obvious for all to see that some politicians literally just don't care if people live or die, especially if they're poor. Unfortunately for us, it still applies very well over 150 years later. In fact, social murder underlies the conservative economic model we currently live under just as prominently as it did before we even had a word for it. In fact, even the, pro even, in fact, even the protections we want to put in place to lessen its effects, such as the welfare state in many Western countries, have been attacked, undermined, and in some cases stripped away in the wake of the neoliberal era, headed by Thatcher, Reagan, and others, and coups, and... CIA death squads, all that good stuff. As a paper by Robert, as a paper by Robert Chenamas and Ian Hudson for the Centre of Crime and Justice Studies puts it, in the early days of capitalism, both economic theory and government policy were dominated by conservative ideas. The results were catastrophic. Edwin Chadwick, Commissioner of the Board of Health of Great Britain from 1848 to 1854 
declared that the poorer classes in the western part of London were exposed to steady, unceasing and sure causes of disease and death particular to them. The result is the same as if 20 or 30,000 of these people were annually taken out of their wretched dwellings and put to death. This is the context of Friedrich Engels' use of the term social murder in the conditions of the working class in England, in which he blamed the diabolical living conditions of workers in the great towns on the economic system. When society places hundreds of proletarians in such a position where they inevitably meet a too early and an unnatural death, one which is quite as much as a death by violence as that by the sword or the bullet, when it deprives thousands of the necessities of life, places them under conditions in which they cannot live, forces them, through the strong arm of the law, to remain in such conditions until that death ensues which is the inevitable consequence, knows that these thousands of victims must perish, and yet permits these conditions to remain, its deed is murder. The people subject to these horrific conditions did not sit passively by and accept their fate. The next hundred years or so constituted a running battle to create institutions, either using the state, which passed protective legislation, or outside the state, by creating things like unions, to alleviate the more debilitating conditions of capitalism. In doing this, they had to battle conservative theorists and the business class, who claimed at every turn that any of these profit-compromising institutions would destroy the economy. Progress was gradually made despite often fierce resistance. The work week was eventually shortened, child labour outlawed, safety and health regulations instituted, and state assistance to the destitute increased. The major gains, however, only came with the combination of the social disaster of the Great Depression, which galvanised the population to insist on state supports, and the full employment of the Second World War, which put the working class in a position sufficiently powerful to force their demands despite the resistance of business. Since around 1980, this trend has been reversed. The protective institutions of society have been whittled away. As in the early 19th century, this involves empowering the business class at the expense of the rest of society. So, that doesn't sound foreboding at all. Yes, the West has slowly undone huge amounts. The progress that it had previously made into establishing a safety net for the most vulnerable. But it's not as if Rishi Sunak would make that worse, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. You want tax cuts for the rich? Sunak's got you. You want cuts to public services? Sunak's got you. Trusts you too. In fact, if you ever caught yourself thinking that perhaps you made a mistake by moving past the Victorian era of kids cleaning the chimneys of the rich and inner city Londoners choking in smog, boy, are you going to be happy with what's coming. And as a columnist for whoever I said I'm writing for this week, I'm ecstatic. The British press is owned by like three super rich assholes, so no matter what happens, my job will be safe. And not only that, if I tried to write anything critical of the current system, I'd get hounded as public life for daring to say, maybe we could try not killing the poor? So it's all going to work out for me in the end. No, the system must perpetuate itself. Throw the pause into a cement mixer and turn it on. It's time for social murder. The rich pay too much tax, don't you know? And you know what? Those disabled people, those trans people, they've had it too good for too long. Don't you hate them? Look at them. Look at them. Look at them and blame them for how shit your life is so you don't notice we're systematically locking you out from ever being able to own property or even live a comfortable life without killing yourself doing backbreaking labour for our benefit. And how can you blame us? It's our money. We can do what we want with it. If you are in a position, you do exactly the same, right? Right. Right. What do you mean you want to redistribute your wealth? You know what? I'm calling the police. <laughs> Viewers from the UK might recognise the phrase social murder as how Labour MP and absolute mad lad John McDonnell used to describe the Grenfell disaster, in which a building full of some of the poorest people of London went up in flames, killing 72 people. If you've never heard of this incident, you might well ask, how does a building go up in flames fast enough to kill so many of its residents? Well, when the building was constructed, flammable cladding was deliberately used to save money, and not even that much of it. An inquiry into the process eventually proved that those involved were well aware of the risk they were taking, and how dangerous it would be to the residents, but to them, saving a few pennies is more important than saving the lives of any potential victims that might result from their malpractice. This is a classic example of the choice to do social murder. 
are best apathetic to the deaths of the poor. These people responsible for commissioning, co the people responsible for commissioning and constructing Grenfell Tower were responsible for the deaths of 72 people. 72 people with families, with hopes and dreams. All snuffed out. And for what? For an infinitesimally small profit margin for some already rich and caring monsters. Social murder isn't just a catchy phrase. Real people are dying because the rich refuse to do even the bare minimum to keep the poor from literally burning alive. To keep the poor from literally starving. And still, they keep getting elected. They keep getting more chances to do it again and again. Now, in this scenario, do you think you'd be more likely to be the people ticking the big burn the poor box on the commissioning slip? Or the people trapped in the building, guilty of nothing at all? Doesn't that just make you want to, I don't know, take some sort of action? Directly? Despite what the Conservative Party of the UK might want you to believe, the lie that they value ambition and social mobility is just that. It's a lie. Or more accurately, it's a convenient half-truth they tell you to disguise their real intent, to keep the rich rich and to keep the poor in their place. Under their ideal system, which, unless you can't tell, we're already living under, you need a poor in the class to do all the jobs they don't want, and to keep them in a rung above. People like Rishi Sunak have spent their whole careers, both in finance and in politics, ensuring that the gap between the rich and poor remains wide open and borderline uncrossable. Sure, every generation, a couple of people might make the leap over, but can that really be called a success story when so many people are left to freeze on the streets? When food bank usage in the UK is an all-time high? Remember, the majority of people who do all the right things in the Conservative Party. Remember, the majority of people who do all the right things the Conservative Party insists they should be doing never become rich. In fact, I'm willing to bet most of you watching this are no more than a few missed paychecks away from becoming homeless. Fuck, I, I know I am. Under the current Conservative-led economic order, everyone is supposed to aspire to become rich. But we don't, but we know deep down, don't we? That that's literally impossible. The system is built to prevent this very possibility. The vast, vast majority of us are much more likely to become homeless than to become a millionaire. And the people like Sunak, that's the system working as intended. And this goes beyond Rishi Sunak himself. Liz Truss is no different. Arguably, she could be worse. And they fundamentally want the same thing. The recent Tory leadership debates have demonstrated incontrovertibly that what every one of these ghouls vying to be Crown Prime Minister without so much as an election want is austerity. And didn't we all agree not too long ago that austerity was literally deadly? As a society, maybe, but conservatism is tied to austerity. Funding public services would really give a helping hand to the most vulnerable in our society. And they're not supposed to be helped. Rishi Sunak and others like him need those of us at the bottom to stay desperate so that he and his colleague can stay rich. But don't come away from this video pessimistic. There is an alternative. In the late 1700s, the level of wealth inequality in France's Ancien Régime was, was staggering. Only taught by the current day, where the lowest 40% of earners in the US, for example, are worse off than 18th century French peasants. And you know, it was pretty brutal, but they did do something about it. Now, there are other facts at play here, so don't at me, I know my history and I'm making a tongue-in-cheek comparison. But, historically, when inequality becomes unbearable, when people have to queue for hours in the freezing cold for a single loaf of bread to feed the families. That creates the perfect environment for civil unrest. And, essentially, when the ruling class makes no moves to make the burden less difficult. Well, those are the conditions that create revolutions. Take Louis XVI of France, for example, or perhaps even more accurately, Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, who so believed in the principles of absolute autocracy that he refused to do anything to alleviate, to alleviate the material conditions of his massive empire, leading to two separate revolutions against him and his eventual execution by the Bolsheviks. I'm going to generalise a bit here, but in conditions of extreme social tension, if your society refuses to bend, it's more likely to break. Do you think the New Deal in the US came about because FDR cared about the poor? No. Roosevelt famously set out to save capitalism during a time of crisis. He forced American society to bend. Not enough, as I think most of us would agree, but it did bend. And the USA survived the 20th century, as did many other capitalist countries that took on some aspects of social democracy to ease the huge tensions of the first half of the 1900s. Will it survive the 20th century? Who knows?
Will the UK survive? I don't know. Not if we continue to head into crisis after crisis under leaders who insist that they can do nothing to help us. But the good news is, we don't need to rely on those people. Clearly, people like Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, both some of the dullest people to ever set foot on a political stage, refuse to do anything to solve any of the crises that face our country. But together, perhaps we can help each other, wherever we can. If those in charge refuse to help, we should start trying to find someone who can. Well, we should start to step up. And if they still refuse to move, then maybe they'll have to be pushed aside to make food for someone or something that can. I'm not calling for anyone to bring out the guillotine here, to be clear. But if the current conservative leadership knew their history and recognised the situation the country is in, from the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, the devastation still being wrought by COVID-19, they would be promising to do a lot more to alleviate the extant tensions in the society they're fighting to lead, if they intend for the country to bend and not to break. Thanks for watching. Hey, thanks for watching this video. This was a cheery subject, wasn't it? Uh, like and subscribe if you feel like it. It might help you forget about all the horrible things I talked about here, but if nothing else, it will help me with the algorithm. Oh, and while you're here, subscribe to my Patreon and give me a one-time donation on coffee if you feel like it. Uh, I'll let me able to eat and pay for my rent. And if you do, I'll read out your name at the end of this video. It's probably in a stupid voice if you want. Um, drop me a message and some money and we'll see about it. And, uh, you know, if you give me enough, I'll be able to move to a room where I can actually look at the auto queue and be able to do a proper green screen without it. It's fucking up like the last one.